I was about to say, I was about to say good evening, but that's not right for most people. Um, so welcome to the fourth IACB webinar. My name is Bernadette Tobin. And our question is ecology and environmental ethics to do with public health ethics and the well-being of human societies. So as I say, this is the fourth of a series of seven webinars hosted by the IACB on the general subject of ethics and pandemics. And tonight's uh, subject matter is One Health, Integral Ecology and Public Health Ethics. Just in case you don't know who we are, the IACB is an international group of ethicists and healthcare practitioners who gather together to advance education and religion in the field of bioethics. We pursue our activities to those ends motivated by a Christian understanding of ethics, bioethics, healthcare and public ethics. So we might um, uh, begin our um, discussion today with a prayer. And what I've done is to choose one of the two prayers with which Pope Francis concluded his great encyclical of 2015, Laudato Si. And it's called A Prayer for Our Earth. A little bit long, but I think you'll see its value to us. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. So today we're gra graced by a marvelous field of thinkers who will challenge us to think clearly and productively on the relationship between ecology, environment, and public health ethics. Our first speaker, Dr. Delia Grace Randolph, is Professor of Food Safety Systems at the Natural Resources Institute at the University of Greenwich uh, in the United Kingdom. Delia is the former jo Joint Program Leader for the Animal and Human Rights Health Program at the International Livestock Research Institute based in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, uh, I think we are um, very lucky indeed to have Delia with us today, not only because of her um, background and knowledge and experience on our topic, but also because in the last day or so, she broke five bones in one of her feet and is still with us today. So Delia, we are very grateful to you. And our second speaker will be Dr. Corey Andrew Labrec. Corey is Associate Professor and Vice Dean of the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies at Laval University, Quebec City in Canada. Delia and Corey will speak first. They will then have an opportunity to respond briefly to each other's reflections. And then our own discussions of their ideas will be led by, by Sister Damien Marie Savino. But let me tell you that 
uh, after Delia and Corey have uh, spoken to us. I will hand over to Mary-Kate Gorky, who will explain how Dr. Bill Sullivan will moderate our discussion. So Delia, if I may, using your first name, uh, may I invite you, first of all, to talk to us today. Good day, good morning, good evening. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here among you all. Uh, um, and I'm delighted to share some of my experiences over the last 20 years, working mainly in the field of animal health, the intersection between animal health, one health pandemics and ethics. Uh, apologies again, as mentioned, I've been uh, rather, rather ill for the last week. <laughs> so it's a, it has been a challenge as well as a pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to break my talk into three parts. The first is to just explain a little bit about ILRI uh, and livestock research in the tropics for poor people. Then I'm going to talk about um, One Health, Eco Health, Planetary Health, just how, how we've been working in that and some of the ethical issues. And I'm going to follow up in my final portion of the talk uh, with one of the hot topics, or we might even say hot potatoes of the day, which is the whole issues around this current COVID-19. Um, so starting with ILRI, where I've spent the last 20 years, that's the International Livestock Research Institute based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I should say that I'm a veterinarian by initial training. Uh, I went on to do a certificate in animal welfare ethics and law before I, I, I did my PhD and postdoc. Um, so ILRI is one of 15 centers based on agricultural research, which were founded nearly 45 years ago. Um, they have three objectives. The first is to reduce hunger. The second is to reduce poverty. And the third is to safeguard natural resources. And their our target group or our, our, the, the people we work for are poor people in low and middle income countries. These centers cover a, a variety of areas such as rice, uh, potatoes, uh, but we're the only center which focuses on livestock. And of course, when you're talking about living animals, there are many more ethical and, and moral issues uh, in addition to those when we're talking about the environment. So at ILRI in the 19, since in the 1990s, we uh, developed what's called a Animal Care and Use Committee. Now, many of you will be familiar with this who do research in animals. And basically it's a committee which has to approve any experiment or involvement of animals in research. And it has some ethical principles, the, 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 the key of which I would say are what we call the three R's replace, reduce, refine. Replace means if you can do the research without animals, if you can do it in, in cell tissue, for example, in cell culture, then don't use animals. Reduce means if you can do it on fewer animals, then use as few as possible. And that's where the biostatisticians help us. And refine means do the research in such a way that it causes the least suffering to animals. Another part of the animal care and use um, assessment is justification of the research. So can this research be justified by a greater good that the suffering of the animals and all research on animals entails some level of suffering, even if it's just being confined, um, can it be justified by benefits to humans or animals? So that's the, the ICAC, which anyone who does research in animals has to, has to sign up to. But it was only in the 2010s that we started our first IRB, uh, which our Institute Review Board. Um, this had not been very common in developing countries where I've been working for the past 25 years. And we were one of the first to start in the CGIR. The IRB, as, as, as you know, I'm sure better than me, um, covers also research not involving contact with animals uh, and looks at other issues around privacy, consent, uh, feedback to animals, vulnerable people, equity. Uh, and I had the privilege and stress of being the first chairperson and the first person to set up 
the IRB at Ilre. In the ensuing decade, we saw many, many other IRBs being uh, established in African countries. And I would say some of the, the messages which, which, which I've taken from that process is one, it's incredibly encouraging to see IRBs and, and this whole issue of ethics, because when I came 25 years ago to, to work in Bangladesh and then in Africa, you, you just got permission to do research and then you went out and did it. There really was no uh, no process for, for getting ethical review. So that is a great step forward. But along with rapid expansion, we have seen some challenges. And I would say the main ones of those are lack of capacity. So we're seeing IRBs being set up by, by people really who have not had training in, in, in bioethics. Um, we're seeing, and, and this is also a problem, I believe in high income countries, this, this issue of kind of mission creep, like, like is everything an IRB issue? Uh, if you are just going out to do a, uh, visit a, a market and talk to a few people about the foods they like to eat, is, does that require ethical permission? It, it's debatable. And then this focus on documentation rather than dilemmas that there really is, it tends to be a rather process driven area where everything is sort of check, check listed and tick boxed and, you know, is this consent form there, is this there, not really getting to the heart of some of these ethical dilemmas. So, for example, one of the principles of uh, most IRBs is that people should give signed consent. Uh, and of course, in, in the communities we work in, many people are either illiterate or else they're very nervous of governments and authorities. So we actually did one study to ask people, what would you prefer? Would you prefer to actually give a signature, and um, which might mean that you're signing away the rights to your land or your shop? Would you rather give a, a thumbprint? Would you rather give just an oral consent? And actually, most people said they preferred to give an oral consent, that they didn't want to give a, a signed consent, which goes against the principles of most IRBs. And then the last and perhaps one of the more worrying aspects is that in many strap cached research centers of the global south, uh, IRBs have been sometimes looked on as ways of income generation with charges of like $500 or $600 for students to have their uh, ethics approval. And it's just basically a rubber stamped. Here in Nairobi, you pay to get a driving license. You don't actually pass a test. So it's hard to be always sure that an ethical approval really means the research is ethical. OK, so quickly on to the next part of my, my talk, which is around One Health. Um, so I guess many or most of us know what One Health is, although there are many, many definitions. So you may choose whichever you prefer. But most of them include some element of the, the health of humans, animals, including wild and domestic, are mutually interdependent and that One Health A is an approach that aims to obtain optimal health across all of these, these sectors, animal, human, environment. There's a couple of closely related approaches or concepts. One is EcoHealth, um, which, which came around about the same time as One Health, and it was actually largely led or supported by um, Canadian researchers and especially funded by IDRC. So that is similar to One Health, but it had a greater emphasis on the environment and non-zoonotic diseases. And lastly, and most recently, is, is planetary health, uh, which focuses on the human health impacts of human-caused disruptions. So that's a little bit narrower. It's looking at human health impacts of human disruptions. EcoHealth is looking at human health impacts of uh, environmental uh, disruptions, be they human or non-human. And One Health is looking equally privileging, if you like, human health, animal health, and the environment. However, all three of these are very closely related and I think increasingly converging. Again, I would just make a little digression here as to say, what is health? Um, now, WHO, the World Health Organization, has for long defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Many of us think that this is maybe 
inspirational rather than aspirational. And even from the point of um, Catholic theology or, or other theologies, it, there is an argument as to whether a world without suffering is either possible or even desirable. Sp spoken here from me with uh, five broken bones, uh, I can tell you I would rather not have them. But do we want, on the other hand, the brave new world of Aldous Huxley, where everyone is, is happy because they're taking you know, soma drugs or they have been biologically programmed to be happy? I think many of us would not see that as the ideal world. But anyway, health in its either narrow or broader sense, I think is something which, which all of us agree is, is, is a good to be desired. Um, One Health, which is the focus of, of this series uh, or this, this, this talk, took its origin in the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, when first of all with SARS outbreak, the first outbreak of um, sudden acute respiratory syndrome, actually Canada had, had quite a problem there, although it originated from civet cats being farmed uh, in China. Um, and then it, it grew to kind of dominate uh, the zoonosis scene uh, with avian influenza, uh, HPAI. Um, since then, we've had many other important zoonosis, uh, Ebola virus disease, uh, Rift Valley fever, West Nile uh, virus, uh, and now, of course, the latest COVID-19. Um, zoonosis, uh, just to, to remind us, are, are diseases that can be transmitted from be between animals and people. Many, many diseases are zoonotic. We sometimes differentiate between old zoonoses, which were originally transmitted from animals to people. Um, and actually many diseases like, like measles or whooping cough, uh, or more recently HIV AIDS, uh, were originally, they jumped from, from animals to people, but now their main transmission is person to person. And that's the case of, of COVID-19. Um, of course, when there's an animal reservoir, as is the case for diseases like, like dengue or um, uh, monkey malaria, we can never be sure that they won't jump back again just because we can control them in people. Uh, doesn't mean that there isn't a chance they'll get out again. HIV AIDS probably made six or seven different jumps from, from uh, primates to humans. Um, so then the other type of zoonosis is what we call the endemic zoonosis, which are, are mainly living, have a reservoir in animals and are being transmitted uh, from animals to people on a sort of a regular basis. And these include diseases like uh, uh, bovine tuberculosis, uh, uh, brucellosis, and of course many foodborne diseases, which is an area I work in particularly, diseases like salmonella, listeria, campylobacter. South Africa not too long ago saw the world's largest outbreak of listeriosis with, with more than a thousand victims. Um, foodborne disease, uh, just to give you a, 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 an idea of zoonosis, about 60% of foodborne disease is, are, are due to zoonotic organisms. And they call, cause a human health burden equivalent to malaria, HIV, AIDS, or TB. And they cause an economic burden in low and middle income countries uh, equivalent to $100 billion a year. So you can see, and this is only one set of subset of zoonosis, so you can see that these are not trivial issues. The World Animal Health Organization, or OIE, sees that One Health is particularly well adapted to deal with three areas. Those are uh, food safety, which I've mentioned, antimicrobial resistance, which some people estimate may be killing as many people as cancer kills by 2050 if it's not controlled, and zoonosis. Both those endemic zoonosis like brucellosis and TB, which mainly afflict, I'm afraid, people in poor countries, but also what we call the emerging zoonotic diseases. And those are diseases which have newly jumped from animals into people, like the examples I gave, uh, Ebola, HIV AIDS, uh, COVID, SARS, MERS. Um, and these, of course, can be incredibly expensive. Uh, again, the World Bank uh, estimates 
in the trillions of dollars. And we still are coming to terms with the, the human uh, env environment, livelihood, well-being, economic costs of, of the COVID-19, which is far from under control in many poor countries which have not succeeded in rolling out vaccines. So that takes me to my third and last part of the, the, the talk, which is again to be a little bit provocative and, and speculative. Um, because, uh, of course, when, when COVID, we know that 75% of these new emerging diseases in humans, these diseases in humans which haven't been there before, have jumped species from animals, often wildlife. Um, and the initial presumption around COVID, especially because it was the second um, SARS virus uh, in, the, in this century to, to have created a havoc was that it was also a spillover, um, especially as closely related coronaviruses are found in bats. Uh, but more recently, there has been some, some kind of uh, contradictions to this narrative or some, some questioning of this narrative. I should say that one of my colleagues, Hung Ingwen, was uh, part of the WHO team who went to Wuhan to uh, try and get to the roots of where COVID-19 came from. And as you've probably seen in the papers, they did not get very far for one reason or another. But here, when it comes to ethics, there's two questions which come up. One is, should we be doing this research at all? One is, should we be, first of all, going out into the wild and capturing wild viruses and taking them into the lab? We know there's lots of lab escapes. Even the best labs in the world have escapes. The first SARS uh, coronavirus escaped six, six times from very good labs. Um, secondly, if we are going to do research on them, and there is a good argument for it, because if we don't know the enemy, how can we defeat them? Should we be do, doing this type of research called gain of function, which means when you deliberately manipulate viruses or bacteria to make them more deadly to humans? And again, the argument is if we do this gain of function, if we make these viruses more deadly, then we will be able to deal with them better if more deadly versions come out. Um, but of course, there's a lot of issues around should we be doing it at all? And are there any downsides of doing these gain of function, making relatively harmless viruses very lethal to people? Uh, and then I, I guess the other ethical issue is, um, if we're going to do this research, either just you know on zoonotic diseases, which is, is, isn't probably acceptable, or gain of function, which is much more uh, controversial, sh how well should we be doing it? How carefully should we be doing it? And there's quite a bit of evidence that in many labs, including the labs in, in Wuhan, there were many lapses of strict biosecurity, um, including several uh, uh, noted by the American embassy, which would again call into question whether if this research should be done, should this lab be doing it? So with those, those three questions, I would like to finish my presentation uh, and thank you for your attention. Ilya, thank you very much indeed for an absolutely wonderful um, presentation. There's an enormous amount in that for us to absorb, let alone um, reflect upon. So thank you very much indeed, particularly in your current circumstances. So we go now to Corey Labrec. Um, Corey, would you like to um, turn on your uh, mic and um, um, give us a theological reflection on um, this common subject matter with Deedes? Thank you, Bernadette. I'm just going to um, share my slides with you, if that's, uh, if that's okay. Does this look okay? Great. So when people ask what I teach as a, as a theological bioethicist, I often say that my, my interests and research are in how and why the Abrahamic religions, primarily the Roman Catholic tradition, think about ethical issues in medicine, <clears throat> healthcare, biotechnology, uh, and the environment. And not infrequently, the reaction to this is, you know, bewilderment. 
environment? Is that like a side thing you have going on because it's a hot topic? Uh, bioethics is not traditionally given to talk about the environment, right? And I have to explain, of course, that theology, bioethics, and the environment are neatly intertwined and that eco-theology is an actual field that the understanding uh, or that an understanding that human health and the health of the earth come hand in hand, as we've just heard uh, from Delia, is not only important, uh, it's pressing. I think the call for a more integrated and integrating understanding <clears throat> of ecology, <clears throat> forgive me, is one that parallels uh, Van Rensselaer Potter's vision for bioethics at the very beginning of its formal, uh, formalization as a discipline. So as many of you know, Potter is the American oncologist biochemist who is often cited as having given preliminary shape to the term bioethics. And speaking of what he would go on to identify as the science of survival, um, Potter was adamant that bioethics must be built on the science of biology and enlarged beyond the traditional boundaries to include the most essential elements of the social sciences and the humanities. So the peculiarity of bioethics was that it would or should be the place where biology, and this was understood broadly by Potter as the foundation on which uh, we build ecology, right? Which is the relation for him, the relationship between plants, animals, humans, and the physical environment and human values. So this biology and human values entering constructive conversation. Somehow along the way though, and somewhere along the way, uh, many bioethicists left ecological concerns by the wayside as they turned their attention primarily to issues in human health and medicine, uh, usually divorced from their ecological contexts, leaving kind of the co-emerging field of environmental ethics uh, to deal with the problems of the natural world on its own. But I digress. Integral is the key adjective here it is the word par excellence of Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, wherein we're reminded that creation is this intricate system that must be tended to comprehensively by stewards who recognize the covenantal and all embracing character of the vocation of caregiving. Um, in many ways, this echoes, I think, the One Health approach you know, to designing and implementing programs, policies, uh, legislation and research in which multiple sectors, health, animal health, plant health, the environment and the social sciences, for instance, communicate and work together to achieve better public health outcomes. So why so many interesting factors here? It's because I think at the end of the day, bodies live in shared ecosystems. Uh, just a few days ago, Pope Francis launched the Laudato Si Action Platform, uh, which I'll put in the chat just after this, which is calling for a from the ground up commitment by families, uh, parishes and dioceses, schools, universities, businesses and farms, religious congregations, hospitals, and other healthcare facilities to a number of sustainability goals within the next seven years. And the action plan and its mobilization of a variety of players here looks to me like a Catholic One Health, right? Or as the Pope would probably prefer to call it, One Common Home, right? This is uh, the subtitle, as you know, of Laudato Si. And in Laudato Si, Pope Francis embeds issues of health in their environmental context and never ceases to remind us about the oft, uh, you know, often neglected impact on the disposable, this is an expression that's often used, the disposable of society. Uh, permit me to offer here an example. In its report on the state of lung disease in diverse communities, under a telling section entitled Environmental Injustice, uh, the American Lung Association finds that communities of color in the United States have higher prevalence and death rates of most, you know, the most common respiratory illnesses than do predominantly white communities which are in large part attributed to substandard indoor and outdoor air quality, as well as uh, residential proximity to freeways and other areas plagued by hazardous emissions. Just in passing, 68% of African-Americans live within about 30 miles of coal-fired power plants. 
So while African-Americans make up 12% of the US population, they account for 25% of all asthma related deaths. So if the health of humans and the health of nature come hand in hand, bioethics, I think clearly needs to be attentive to both. Pope Francis's call for integral ecology reminds us, I think, as the Christian feminist eco-theologian Sally McVeigh has brought to the fore in her own work, that creation is not merely the backdrop of salvation, but is the place where it all happens and to whom it all happens. So the creation accounts, the incarnation, the sacraments, the healing narratives of Jesus and the eschatological vision, right, of the new heaven and the new earth, underline belief in a God who values all bodies in the natural world, including, if not especially, the vulnerable, outcast, needy bodies, um, as uh, McVeigh puts it. And it's on account of our bodies, Pope Francis goes on to write, that humans are so closely bound to the natural world, so much so that we can feel the desertification uh, of the soil almost as a physical ailment and the extinction of a species as a painful disfigurement. Like Sally McFaig, uh, Pope Francis sees nature as the new poor, right? The earth herself burdened and laid waste, he says, as he opens Laudato Si, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. Turning attention toward the desperate state of the natural world does not and must not amount in any way to a desertion of the human poor, uh, but to an important understanding that every violation of solidarity and civic friendship harms the environment, just as environmental deterioration in turn upsets relations in society. Nature, particularly in our time, is so deeply integrated into the dynamics of society, Pope Francis writes, and in culture, that by now it hardly constitutes an independent variable. Neglecting this relationship, he says, imperils life itself. Laudato Si makes this plain, you know, framing a number of ecological issues, such as uh, the loss of biodiversity, uh, the access to safe drinkable water, in terms of rights and bringing to light the ecological debt that exists between the global north and the, global, uh, and, and the south. The WHO reminds us that the global south experiences something like 90% of the world's burden of disease, although only about 10% of research resources are devoted to such issues. Let me echo here uh, the words of the Reverend uh, Gerald Durley who is uh, the retired senior pastor of Providence Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta, who I met when I was there, and uh, who was recognized uh, a few years ago as what's called a champion of change at the time by President Barack Obama. Reverend Durley frames the discussion uh, in this way. Climate change is a civil rights issue. We are seeing its impacts in our own communities in the form of record-breaking temperatures, floods, droughts, hurricanes, and the list goes on and on. When your children suffer from asthma and cannot go outside to play, as is in the case for many in Atlanta, as I've just uh, previously mentioned, it is a civil rights issue. When unprecedented weather disasters devastate the poorest neighborhoods in places like New Orleans, New Jersey, and New York, it is a civil rights issue. When farmers in faraway lands cannot feed their families because the rains will no longer come, it is a civil rights issue. I would be remiss if I did not also call to mind parallels here with our First Nations communities, right, who struggle for access to safe and reliable drinking water in Canada and abroad or to pleadings for healthcare authorities to identify, develop and implement adaptation strategies to moderate the health effects of climate change being felt in the Canadian Arctic, where indigenous populations, particularly Inuit, are especially vulnerable to said changes. And I can go on, right? We can scan the globe, making tight connections between peoples and place-based challenges to health. 
I need not draw out here how the pandemic has surfaced, right, in a stark way, the myriad of injustices and inequities in access to healthcare. I think of, you know, the allocation of increasingly limited intensive care resources, uh, the racial disparity in those being uh, infected and killed by the virus, and the impact of social determinants of health. Care for our common home, therefore, is an ethical imperative that does not come at the expense of concern for the human poor, as some might suggest, but on the contrary must be thought of as integral, I think, to the church's longstanding commitment to the vulnerable, the disposable, and the oppressed. And I think at the end of the day that we can also talk about the works of mercy within the context of the environment. The dispute over the degree to which humans play a role in global environmental changes with uh, climate as a case in point is not all that important, if I may, for Christians and Jews and other peoples of faith in terms of determining whether or not one should act, right? The message of the sacred texts, I think, is quite clear. Um, if I may, you know, humans are at the very least tenants of an earth that we are reminded over and again, uh, ultimately belongs to God. At best, uh, humans are stewards, finite participants in natural processes that we did not create and that do not necessarily conform to human moral preferences and expectations. Rather than controllers, humans are by our own nature dependent, uh, as we say in theology, on the deity, on others, and on the created world. Take note, for instance, of the number of times in Genesis alone, where God rolls his eyes, uh, so to speak, at the human penchant for insisting on absolute independence, absolute self-determination, and absolute self-sufficiency. You'll remember that Adam and Eve are punished for it. And so is the ambitious community uh, bent on making a name for itself in the story of the Tower of Babel. So looking ahead, you know, I share the conviction of Michael Rozier uh, at the St. Louis University College for Public Health and Social Justice, a colleague of Jason Ebrill, who is uh, uh, maybe going to be joining us uh, today. That the resources and influence of faith-based organizations are so substantial across the globe that public health would accomplish a fraction of what is possible by pushing aside such a significant partner. Let me just conclude uh, with this. Being uh, formed from the earth for the earth inevitably makes uh, the global environmental crisis a global human health crisis. Protecting the whole of creation is a sine qua non of being Christian, the church's preferential option for the poor and its emphasis on dignity, on solidarity, on stewardship, as well as I think, you know, on the vocation and ministry of healing writ large, compel Catholic bioethics, compel Christian bioethics and Catholic or Christian public health ethics, if we are to distinguish between the two, to envision humans and the environment in a dynamic covenantal partnership in which the health of one is deeply affected by the health of the other. I think I can uh, bring the comments to a close there. Thank you. Corey, thank you very much indeed for a, a, a terrific um, presentation. Now, um, before I turn to Mary Kate and Bill Sullivan, um, did, is there any comment that that you would like to make on what Corey has said or any question you would like to ask him? Uh, no, just to thank him. I'm aware we're slightly over time, so I, I won't intrude on the audience's time anymore. Thank you. Okay, dearly, thank you. And Corey, was there anything uh, that you wanted to raise with Delia before we open up to a more general discussion? I, I can't wait to hear what people um, have to say and have, have to discuss, but just one very quick, if I may, question to Delia. I love that presentation, Delia, which was so grounded, I think, in many ways. This is really important for us who are theologians and for those of us who work in bioethics, certainly from religious traditions. But, you know, I've always wondered about one, the One Health mo movement, I, the One Health movement, and I love the way you've described it as, as 
trying or at least attempting to equally privilege, right? Human health, animal health, environmental health, uh, planetary health. But I always wonder how on the ground, um, Delia, how, how does speciesism inter, you know, speciesism and this prejudice for our own that favors our own species, especially as humans, how does that interfere on the ground with, with this really noble, I think, attempt? Yeah, well, just very, very briefly, I think there's no doubt that um, uh, animals and the environment are the Cinderella twins of human health. If we look at the, the amount of money, the amount of personnel, the amount of interest, uh, it's very clear that, that it's human health which trumps animal health and environment health in practice. Thanks. Thank you, Delia, and um, thank you, Corey. So, um, Mary Kate, I'm going to hand over to you now to um, lead us in the second part of our webinar. Um, Bill, then maybe you could take us on from here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bernadette, and, and thank you very much uh, for those wonderful uh, presentations that I think will start a very uh, important and fruitful conversation. I think what Mary-Kate uh, would have said was that um, this part of the, the discussion is for um, members of the audience um, to kind of uh, ask some questions that uh, we will be recording, if you could ask them in the chat. Um, we will organize them and try to group them. Um, and, and then I, I will uh, express those questions on your behalf. Um, and uh, also encouraging uh, presenters to kind of respond to one another uh, as you wish. Um, I, I think the only other thing to say is I'm, um, I'm actually a family physician uh, and a background in philosophy, uh, but I, I actually began in uh, veterinary medicine. So actually this is a very uh, interesting topic to me because I've been doing uh, human health ethics for a long time and um, really not uh, actually paying much attention to this larger context. And I think that many uh, of my colleagues in healthcare also need a wake up call uh, for the, the importance of this topic. Now, um, just to start things off, I just, uh, uh, wanted to get another uh, comment uh, from uh, Dr. Del, um, uh, or Sister Damien Marie Salvino, who is a, a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist and the Dean of Sci Science and Substa uh, Sustainability at Aquinas College, Grand Rapids, Michigan in the US. Um, and uh, an expert, uh, a real, bringing kind of an expertise on uh, soil. Uh, issues. So Sister Damien, if, if you're able to, um, you know, unmute yourself and if you wish to turn on your video and, and make a comment or ask a question, that would be great. Okay, well, yes, thank you. I'm uh, very honored to be here. This is my first time uh, joining, joining this group. So thank you both for your presentations. And when uh, I was asked to make a comment, it was just to maybe to refer to some of the uh, previous research that I've done which I can see after listening to your presentations really ties in with what you're talking about, about the connection between human health and ecological health. And so, and, and this notion of care as an ethics that is being promoted in La Dato Si. And I think it goes beyond actually stewardship, which more is kind of a sense of duty and obligation, but care is like a, almost an affection or a, an ethic of love that we would, um, bring to our holistic look at human and ecological health. And one area where I kind of felt the, the disease of species as a personal disfigurement in a sense, it, and that led me to research more in this area was the, the situation of endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are found in plastics, uh, pharmaceuticals, pesticides, many of the uh, perfumes, cosmetics, and they're ubiqui ubiquitous now in air and water and soil. And they also bioaccumulate up the food chain. So there's a natural connection all the way through the food chain. And I became familiar with this at the university when um, I 
met some researchers at the University of Colorado. They were doing like standard fish, fish studies upstream and downstream of the wastewater treatment plant in Boulder. And upstream, it was about a 50-50 distribution of male and female fish. But downstream, the, the number of male fish dropped dramatically and the number of fish that were intersex, so they had ovaries and, and uh, testes within them, and many of them were infertile. So downstream, that number increased dramatically. About a quarter of the fish were, had uh, apparently been feminized as a result of exposure to the wastewater. And when they looked into the causes of it, it turned out to be EDCs and especially um, EE2, which is a kind of ethanyl estradiol. It's a hormone. And these EDCs act like hormone mimics or they disrupt hormonal processes. And EE2 is used as a hormone treatment, say for livestock, and it's also used in human birth control pills. So when humans take the birth control pill, they excrete it, and then uh, it travels through the sewer pipes to the wastewater treatment plant. And most of the wastewater treatment plants are not equipped to treat these kind of chemicals. So then it's released into the environment. And now after that research in the early 2000s, we have now been putting together research over the past 40 years to show that actually these effects of hormone disrupting chemicals are being found across food webs. I mean, from invertebrates all the way through to mammals. And now more recently, we're documenting situations in humans. And it seems there are, so there are many reproductive and developmental anomalies that result upon exposure to these chemicals. And so it was very chilling to me to be involved in this research and see those connections, which I always knew were there, but to see it in that way in a particular case. Um, and to see also the deformities in the animals and then realize, my gosh, this is affecting us as humans as well. So I think, you know, are we sowing beauty or are we sowing pollution and destruction as the Pope prays in that prayer at the end of Laudato Si that we opened with so beautifully. And I think there's a number of ethical imperatives. So what, what you've all been saying, and then also, is this a way to look at questions of, you know, if birth control pills are a big source of this and they are one source, is this a natural argument against using such synthesized chemicals for birth control? I mean, I think it's just, it might be controversial, but it's something I think we really need to ask ourselves, do I want to take this pharmaceutical and affect the rest of the environment in that way? So that's another aspect of the ethical questions I think that we're dealing with. So, um, and, I, and I think also now Sister Raffaella, one of my sisters is on this call and she and I are working also on a project on One Health and social ecological systems theory in relation to the pandemic. So again, trying to look at the human and ecological connections. So I think, I hope that stimulates some further conversation then about these connections between human and ecological health and including that animal link very importantly. So I, I hope that that uh, can stimulate some conversation and thank you both of the speakers, tremendous talks. Thank you, Sister Damien. Those are excellent comments. Do the speakers wish to um, say anything in response? I'd just like to quickly bring up a, a, a point the sister made early in the, her, her, um, her, her uh, response about care going beyond stewardship. Um, I think in terms of the way we look at, at, at domestic livestock, and I trained as a veterinarian originally as well, in the West or the high income countries, it often is more of stewardship. But when we uh, are in the low and middle income countries, um, when we talk to people about how they regard their animals, um, it really is as a member of their family. They, and often when we look at, for example, health seeking behavior, like whether people will go and seek treatment for their child or for their cow, it's the same. 70% of people will for their child and will also for the, their cow and 30% won't. So in some ways, people in developing countries have a much more blurred distinction between their human family and their animal family. Perhaps it's more the, the way um, 
people in, in, in high income countries often think of their pets might be the way people think of their livestock uh, in low and middle income countries. Thank you. And Corey, any comment or question? Uh, I can, and I can continue that, you know, I, I even continuing on this point that I, whenever I hear the word stewardship, right, it's, it's often within the Christian or Jewish uh, traditions when we speak about environmentalism. But um, some of you will know that Arnie Ness, you know, who is often cited as being one of the founders of the deep ecology movement, often thought that stewardship was a deeply anthropocentric, you know, human centered a concept that um, makes humans look like they're esteemed intermediaries between uh, the divine and the non-human animal world. And so, you know, when Sister Damien, when you mentioned, you know, this, this language of the vocation of caregiving going beyond the human realm and perhaps moving into the non-human animal realm, I think that's incredibly important. And I think, you know, there, I was just reading not so long ago about, you know, an article again by, I think it was Michael Rozier, who was writing about how Catholic theology has something to offer public health ethics that we always forget. You know, we kind of stop the buck, if I may, at um, medical care. And we don't, we don't talk about public health, for instance, as a vocation, as we do with the, heal the other kinds of healing ministries. So I think this understanding of like expanding the notion of care to include or to go beyond the human, and I'm not, I don't mean to neglect the human, but to include the human alongside the other inhabitants of the earth, for instance, is... A, is pressing and I think it's a very good way of reframing much of this discussion. So thank you for that. Great. Um, I, I would just sort of uh, maybe pull back a bit at this moment and, uh, uh, and just kind of look at the definition of One Health that uh, uh, Corey provided. And uh, there's two aspects. Uh, one is sort of designing, um, basically thinking up a way of working together uh, and, and integrating across these different domains, uh, disciplines and sectors, uh, and then implementing two quite different goals actually. But the ultimate goal is uh, increase uh, kind of uh, public health outcomes, I presume of humans. <laughs> uh, but I guess the first question, and I think this is um, kind of a challenge to uh, the academy is, is this idea of integrating across disciplines and actually seeing that as a legitimate and necessary thing to do. So, so what I, I'll give each of you a chance to kind of respond to the, the critique that this is outside of my range of concern, that, that what you're talking about, that's for somebody else to do. Uh, what would you say to that? And, and particularly outside of the field of bioethics, which essentially is human health ethics. That's a critique, I would think. Well, I, it's, a, it's a very good question. I would just make one little distinction. Um, as I mentioned, eco-health and planetary health, there are many, many definitions, but common definitions of eco-health and planetary health are about optimizing human health by, uh, by either you know, optimizing environment health or by minimizing human impacts on environments and animals. Whereas One Health is about optimizing all healths, human health, animal health, and, and uh, planetary health. When it comes to integration, I must say, at the highest level, I think integration has, has gone very well. Um, the WHO, the World Health Organization, the World Animal Health Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization have for several decades now have what they call a tripartite agreement, which explicitly says that One Health is the way that they will address these problems at the interface of, of humans, animals, and the environment. Um, the World Bank has also just recently operationalized One Health, which means that across all its massive portfolio of projects, One Health should be there. Many, many governments have got a One Health unit, a One Health department, but where it tends to break down a bit um, is two places. One is in academia, where I'm afraid we're still very sectoral. And the other is on the front line, where we still see, um, with some noted exceptions, and there are some really good, um, uh, including, for example, Canada has one of the, the very few laboratories which deals with both human and animal uh, specimens. And yet there's no reason why, especially in resource poor countries, any lab can't deal with 
you know, a swab or a, a, a blood a serum sample, whether it comes from an animal or a human, it, it's the same PCR machine it goes into. Um, but with many, with a few, you know, really excellent examples, um, we're not seeing very good integration at the front line uh, yet. And we've, that's been an acknowledged problem since the beginning of One Health uh, two decades ago. Thank you. Corey, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, and I just poured out such wisdom. No, not at all. But, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, you know, th this question of the value of interdisciplinarity in the academy, you know, in the university, for instance, has been, I think, uh, part of the lingo for the past, um, for the past little while. And what we do see in the universities, for instance, is exactly that, this deep value in interdisciplinarity that we need to champion. But what ends up happening, I think, even though it's in our white papers and it's in our, you know, it's all over the university's mottos, for instance, is that we're quite good at multidisciplinarity where we have different domains or fields working side by side, but we're very, we're not so good at bridging those disciplines so that there's conversation between the two, right? There's, it's one thing to say that a theology, the theology building and the medical building are side by side and look how interdisciplinary we are. That's multidisciplinary. Inter, where there is this communication between the two is something that's a lot, a lot trickier. And in fact, this is exactly what we see still today with something like theology, religion, and bioethics, as you well know, right? So theology and religion were, were, you know, attended the birth of bioethics very much with philosophy. But today, and it's been quite a while, of course, we ask the question, so, so what exactly is our contribution as theologians, as specialists in religion, to public bioethical discourse? What language do we use? So do I check the language of God and faith and so on and so forth at the door so that I can just kind of pick up the lingo, the le mostly legal lingo with everyone else so that it seems like I have some, you know, some contribution to make. That, that is still an uphill battle, I think, in many ways. And so what we're seeing, certainly in terms of Catholic public, public, health, uh, public health ethics, I think, is what exactly can we bring in from the traditions, right? That's going to, that's going to bring clarity, that's going to be important for the way uh, that we govern, that way that we give care, for instance, as Sister Damien was saying, what exactly can we import from these traditions and borrow from these traditions in order to make this happen? And there are people who have talked about, for instance, the language of vocation, I think I mentioned in passing, in Christian culture, for instance, that we see with for doctors, right? We talk about the vocation of medicine, the vocation of healthcare and caregiving, but we don't really talk about the vocation of public health. And there is some language that we can move into that, I think, into that domain rather neatly, you know, and the preferential option for the poor, I think, which is a deep commitment that I mentioned uh, in my own presentation, is something else that can be easily brought in from the tradition into a public uh, discourse model where in real interdisciplinarity, right, real exchange can happen uh, despite the whole language barrier. Excellent. Um, we have one, one question from um, actually Christine Jameson. Um, I, I, I would invite Christine to, to voice the question if she wishes, uh, but essentially asking about this association uh, between uh, humanity's relationship to the earth, typically understood as feminine, <laughs> and uh, the whole problem of abuse against women. And uh, wondering whether dealing with the problem of abuse against women might inform our conversation about uh, abuse of the earth and the holistic health of humans, animals, and the environment. Yeah, I'll just maybe <clears throat> say something a little bit further. Just, I mean, I've noticed that connection a lot. And, um, and it's, I mean, what's interesting uh, near where I live in Quebec, there's been a high, high rate of um, violence against women uh, since the pandemic began. And, and it's just so interesting to think about, you know, we think about the earth as feminine um, because the earth nurtures us. And, and yet you kind of wonder about uh, the connection between the abuse of the earth and the abuse of women. And that may be underlying, you know, I would say probably pre-conscious orientation of this need to dominate and need to destroy almost. So I'm just, I just was wondering if it might be interesting to kind of go down that road a little bit to think about, you know, and thinking about ways to, as, as Delia said, if we don't know the enemy, how can we, 
How can we fight the enemy? How can we find ways to deal with it? So this might be one, one thing to think about in terms of a kind of a, yeah, a kind of a dis, you know, a problem here that we need to really address. Seeing as this is a, 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 a talk on ethics, I, again, I'm, I'm going to be a little provocative here. Um, and uh, having worked in, in, in what we used to call the developing world or the global south for the last 25 years, uh, when, when Corey was talking so, so eloquently about poverty and poverty and equity as, a, as, a, as an ethical issue, um, I think there's also a bi-directionality. I mean, what I've seen uh, is that oftentimes the poorest, and it's not that they don't care. I mean, I think I, I was telling you how much people do genuinely care for their animals, their families. Um, but you also see very high levels of violence and domestic violence in very poor communities. And you also see very high levels of actually unsustainable land use. We see this very much in Africa where, you know, poaching has has really removed wild animals the larger wild animals from most of west and central africa uh, so it's, it's a question of choices and, and options whereas in the east coast of north america um there's actually been a rewilding and in much of europe because land which previously would have been you know small impoverished farmers would would be able to eke a living out of just became unviable and and so they left and went somewhere else and that th 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 those areas have been rewilded so i'm not perhaps answering you directly but i i do think you're right in that it's there is a connection between all of these issues that it's not just um a, a, sort of a a silo again and we get back maybe to to, to integration that where we see is problems in one area we often see problems in another area and so we therefore need holistic and systemic solutions that that rather than our typical science just you know silver bullet type approaches to trying to solve these issues uh so just a, some some quick feedback thanks excellent if i may yeah christine this is such a great question the, and it's i think at the heart of ecofeminism Right, which is um, a love, uh, a, a really power. I, I, I think a really telling and um, insightful uh, field now within eco and within environmentalism, environmental ethics writ large. And you know, I think of the work of Vandana Shiva and Rosemary Radford Ruther and um, and Sally McFaig, who I cited today. You know, and what I think about exactly as you mentioned is that this this whole idea of the feminization of nature, either as our sister or as our mother and the masculinization of science and the deep dichotomy between the two is still with us, whether we want to say that we've overcome it or not. And it's been with us for a long time, right? And think about somebody like Bacon, for instance, when he wrote about nature, he actually talked about nature certainly as female and as our job, our job as masculinized science to bind, this is the language, right? To bind nature and uh, to extract her wisdom, right? This, the deeply aggressive, it's quite a, a quite aggressive imagery, right, that we see in the texts. And some people say, well, we've come beyond it. But, you know, in ecofeminism, one of the tenets is, I think, as you, you've just mentioned so beautifully, is, is, is what is sometimes called co-victimization and co-liberation, right? That, that the, the exploitation of women and the exploitation of the natural world may come hand in hand for good or for not, never for good, but you know, whether we want to admit that link or not, and as does the co-liberation, right? As does co-liberation. So the liberation of women and the liberation of nature. And that's deeply kind of debated, I think, in eco-feminist circles. And just very quickly, what's interesting about all of this to me is somebody like Sally McFaig, who says, listen, at the end of the day, if the metaphors that we use to describe nature and, and describe God, for instance, are either broken or tainted or poisoned or, um, or, or problematically, you know, problematically kind of present some kind of a, oppressive uh, image of these, of these figures, then perhaps we need to rethink them, right? And I think that's what ecofeminism is doing. And perhaps this is where your comment is, is inspiring us. Thank you, Christine. Excellent. Um, so there, there is um, 
a comment um, by um, Anne Sirek, who talks about um, kind of a distinction between uh, secular ethic in which autonomy is sort of central, fundamental assumption, and a Christian or faith-based ethic where a fundamental assumption is a very different notion of freedom as uh, participating in the divine. And she's just wondering whether this difference is contributing to the difficulty of interdisciplinary integrated dialogue. Again, I would just say, I would, I would add a, a third leg to that stool, um, that this focus on autonomy, it, it's not something which we often find in, in poor rural communities uh, in, in, in low and middle income countries who, who are highly dependent upon each other. And often um, when we try, as we have in the past couple of decades, just, just transplant the ideas from IRBs and you know bioethics from, from the north to the global south, it often doesn't work because you know you can't do research without getting permission of, of the chief, for example, the village chief. And that, that goes, and if he gives permission, everybody gives permission. And if he gives permission, nobody gives permission. And yet we go around with our um, consent forms, assuming that everybody is, you know, as you say, autonomous and is, is freely able to. So when we, we many of our questionnaires, we get 99% um, uh, completion rate, which for me says, people are not making a free choice here. And I think that we, we also need to, to just bring in that cultural dimension. It's, it's a slight digression, and I agree with what you're saying, but I think it's just another dimension along with, with the, the autonomous and the secular versus the, 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 the more kind of faith-based values. Thank you. And Corey, any comment? Sure, I mean, I'll be brief here. The, the, Cause I think we have, um... Uh, a, a, a huge, uh, we have a great group here, I suspect, of people who know autonomy, I know, and have studied the principle of autonomy quite well and can actually um, also respond, you know, to some of the comments here. But in, in the church, and I, I, I tried to mention this today, that in, in the church, what's interesting is that autonomy is, a, is, a, is, a, is something that's championed as a principle, as a bioethical principle. It's something that uh, we adhere to, to be sure, but with certain condition, right, that it is, um, that it is deeply tied to context, it is deeply tied to relationality, it is deeply tied to communion and covenant, right? So we don't understand uh, autonomy outside, you know, we don't understand autonomy as this absolute self-sufficiency, uh, absolute independence, which is uh, considered to be problematic. And it really does come down to the church's um, notion also that, that vulnerability is not some kind of discrete category of people out there, right? The elderly, um, people with disabilities and so on and so forth. But that is a sh it's, a shared, um, it's a shared part of the human condition, which therefore makes autonomy necessarily relational. Do you see what I mean? There's, there's a certain kind of shared want for decision-making that is rooted, I think, at the end of the day in, um, in, shared, in shared vulnerability. But I suspect others have um, more to say about autonomy as well. Yes, big, big topic for sure. Um, another question um, from Yas Valley, um, and it goes back to this sort of definition of health. Um, and he's just wondering whether it's helpful to expand the notion of health to encompass the being well of everything in existence. So I, I suppose he, uh, the question is, you know, this is a, already the definition of a health was very broad, uh, but this is even more broad. Uh, so any, any feedback on that comment? I think he, that is the way things are moving. I mean, obviously there is some pushback against that. We've always talked about animal health, animal welfare, um, but in terms of like planetary health, that is a slightly newer concept. And in some ways, it's, it can be a little bit confusing because, of course, people sometimes find it difficult to conceptualize what exactly you can't take the temperature of a, of a rainforest. Well, you can, but I mean, it's not just health in the same way as it is health of, of, of people. Um, but I think it, for me, and obviously some people will not have think otherwise, that it is a very useful concept 
and one which I'm hearing increasingly. Um, so let's let's. I hope I hope that it it, it gets traction. Thanks. I think it also speaks to complexity. So uh, just by way of a comment um, at the University of Toronto, which is uh, uh, the medical school, one of the largest in Canada, uh, they have uh, an extended course in the undergraduate education on complexity. And when I went through my studies, nobody talked about this. But uh, I think that the acknowledgement is that um, much of what we deal with, even in healthcare of humans, is complex. And unless you start to uh, uh, factor in all the dynamics, um, you're often giving, uh, you know, um, not very sound advice. And so I think that a similar uh, argument could be made if we're talking about uh, human health to see it as complex. And part of the complexity is that it includes the health of animals and the environment. Um, so Corey, did you have any comment on that point? Yeah, I, I think it, it might come down to um, to maybe my 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 first question that I asked um, to Delia to Delia as well, right? This notion of speciesism and anthropocentrism is is kind of getting in the way of enlarging or expanding our notion of health because we just think that first we need to deal with humans, then we need to move along to nature, which is not of course, the orientation that really fits certainly the One Health understanding or the understanding of health that's put forward in Laudato Si that says, well, good luck with that because you can't possibly think about human health without addressing um, all of these important dimensions of environmental health. And so I wonder if there's going to be always this reticence because we think anthropocentrically as, as humans yes. uh, do. And we wanna be focused. <laughs> so actually <clears throat> there was a, also another comment from uh, Dennis Lavery. Um, who is uh, making the point that uh, despite all the talk about environmental stewardship, uh, Laudate Si is itself anthropocentric and that uh, you know, it's, uh, humans are at the apex. And I'm, I'm just wondering, at least he's also wondering uh, whether there's some uh, dangers in this and kind of a, an excessive anthropomorphism anthropomorphizing uh, the natural world and even extending into products that uh, people make. And he, he's referring to AI robots and, and the like that affect uh, the human machine relation. <laughs> so just, uh, yeah, I, I guess mean, an acknowledgement uh, that that is part of the framework. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting and I'll be very, I'll be brief with this that you may have all read this really stellar text by Lynn White Jr., right? Who, who said that at the end of the day, it's in the, it's in the journal Science 1967, he published this and said, at the end of the day, religion is to blame for the eco-crisis. Uh, and he says, mostly Christianity, which is the most anthropocentric religion the world has ever known, right? Completely focused on the human and everything else has been made by God in order to serve it. I think that's a misreading of the biblical text, but this is the uh, critic, uh, this is the criticism that he brings to the conversation. What's interesting is in Catholic culture, um, certainly around uh, a lot of this discussion is that you'll see very clearly, for instance, in the in the compendium for the social doctrine of the church, for instance, that that the church will outright say, or at least readers in the church will outright say that we are not biocentric, or we do not promote biocentrism, which puts all life at the center of uh, ethical systems, or ecocentrism that puts the collective at the center of ethical systems. But we are, and, and, and I think even in Laudato Si, there is no real denial of Christianity being necessarily anthropocentric. What the critique is in Laudato Si is, is against tyrannical anthropocentrism, right? That has absolute no regard for other creatures. And that's where it gets interesting because I don't think the Pope is saying, let's stop being human centered and move ourselves away, you know, from humans at the center or human dignity at the center of things. I think he is saying, can we not have it perhaps both ways where the human as the image of God has a certain esteem in creation, but at the same time has a deep responsibility kind of linked to that esteem. And I think that's where it comes. And I have lots to say about anthropomorphization, by the way, that, that is very interesting and I won't get into it here, but if you look at the opening accounts, right? You see a God who is, whatever this means, walking in the garden before he encounters Adam and Eve. And I think, 
anthropomorphism, which could be problematic, is actually quite rich. You see this in fleshing of God so that he can properly encounter, if I may, the human world and the incarnation in many ways is based on that. But there you are. Yes, just to go back to what I was saying when, when I was talking about eco health, planetary health, one health, there is a very real tension between those who see the environment and animals as means to an end. And that end is, is human health or human well-being, or which is the broader WHO definition. And those who see animal health and environment health as an end in itself. Uh, and again, to go back to, to poverty, I, I would say that the poorer people are, the more they are likely to see human health and well-being as the, the ultimate goal. And the more we kind of have the luxury, we, 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 we then kind of put animal health and planetary health as an end in itself. But on a warning note, there is evidence from the Stockholm Resilience Center that we are already exceeding several uh, what they call planetary boundaries, not just climate change, but also biodiversity, uh, nutrient cycles. Uh, we're already using the resources of two and a half Earths to feed, the, to, to keep, maintain the, the one Earth we have. So if we don't manage the only Earth we have, the only Earth we're likely to get, then we probably won't have a humanity to, to be an end in itself, even if, if that is the way one chooses to think, if that is the way one's value system works. Thank exactly. You. Yes, and it, it, it kind of makes, makes me think that the, the, you know, uh, the global co cooperation that we've experienced in uh, kind of responding to this pandemic is like a, uh, a dress rehearsal. For, for much bigger issues as you're raising. Now, one final thing that I would uh, uh, want to mention, and it, again, kind of pulls us back out a little bit to the, this broad definition of One Health. The second element in the definition is about implementing change. And I think that this is where, um, you know, uh, one I thought that came up was the importance of the partnership with Christianity, the Catholic Church, etc. Uh, as an, a part of an implementation strategy. And in fact, I work with implementation scientists and they see partnerships as an important thing to measure in, in terms of actual implementing of change. And I think one of the, one of the concerns uh, is that there's all this great talk, but no action. And uh, we've even seen that with this pandemic, which is actually not that complex, but we've got poor action. And so could you make any comments about that second half of One Health? We can do all this talk, but if we don't actually have expertise on how to implement these great ideas, then it's just about a lot of hot air. I think we have expertise. What we don't have is, um, you know, resources and, and, and willpower. And as they say, never let a crisis go to waste. I, I think this pandemic has come as a wake up control a wake up call. I think in some ways it's also brought out the worst in, in, in us. I mean, we've seen that in, in, in hoarding of, 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 of equipment in sort of, you know, keeping vaccines for, for my country uh, rather than, than thinking about if I don't get, you know, it, COVID under control in India, it's going to come back to my country for sure. Um, but yes, hopefully it will be a wake up call and that we will do things better in the future. We can hardly do things worse, to be honest. <laughs> and Corey, any comment on that? I mean, I, th I think what we've seen, and I think this is what Delia was saying as well, is that, you know, collaboration and competition are not all that good partners. You know, like, I mean, it could be perhaps, but, but this is what we're seeing is, is competition that often gets in the way of, of collaboration that can lead to the common, you know, to, to a better appreciation of the common good. I, I'm really delighted that, you know, two or three days before this, um, this uh, presentation that we had, this, this session that we had this uh, today, that the Pope did speak about his uh, Laudato Si Action platform, right? This just came out a few days ago, where in, you know, five years or so following the publication of the encyclical, the Pope says, okay, let's put this into action. You know, you've had enough time, if I may, I'm paraphrasing. You've had enough time to read the text because it's quite long. It's taken you for perhaps five years uh, to read the text. 
now let's go forward. Here are the elements that we're looking at concentrating on, uh, everything from the investment to renewable energy, to uh, adopting silver lamps, lifestyles, to carbon neutrality, et cetera, et cetera. And, what, and the question is, again, the one that you're asking here, Bill, you know, is all about, okay, great. Those are great things that we can, I think Dilly was talking about the checkbox, right? That those are things that we can easily check off. But the question is then, how do we actually do those things, which have all kinds of effects for human health? And I think this is what this, um, this action platform, which is supposed to move, it's, it, it, it's thought of as a grass, grassroots movement is, is supposed to do, right? Work from within the communities, not as a top down, but from there understanding the deep implications of what it means to get involved environmentally for human health. So I think we're, work we're working our way towards there, yeah. Yeah, and a great metaphor, a platform. So, so maybe on that, uh, there's been a few other uh, excellent questions that uh, we could maybe share uh, with the presenters uh, after the webinar, but I would like to, now conclude the, this part and turn it back to uh, Bernadette Tobin for some summary remarks and uh, a little advertisement for the next one. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about summary remarks, but if I could just pick up one thing um, that uh, each person, uh, each of our speakers has said, um, and with Delia's, I'd like to pick up one of the things that she said at the very end, the tension between those two views of our subject matter tonight. On the one hand, there are those who think of the health of animals and of the environment as a means to an end. And on the other hand, those who think of the health of animals and in the and the environment as an end in itself. Now, it came very late in what uh, Delia had to say to us, but it's a wonderfully um, um, evocative question of the issues that we have been canvassing today. Um, I, I, as for Corey, I don't think I can go past the wonderful image he gave us of God rolling his eyes at the behavior of human beings. I think that's a wonderful way of capturing um, quite a lot of what goes on in Genesis about God. And Corey also raised the question of whether the environment is a proper object of not stewardship, not care, but mercy. So again, I think it's a very provocative question. Um, as we were speaking, uh, and then, of course, Sister Damien Marie it, it encouraged us to move beyond stewardship of to care for. And the question was then raised whether stewardship is an anthropocentric concept. And, of course, um, we believe that humans are made in the image and likeness of God. So uh, Corey helpfully pointed out that what is condemned in Laudato Si which I must say, I'm beginning to think I never read. I certainly have to go back and read it again after today's discussion. But what is uh, condemned is a tyrannical anthropocentrism. So it's been a wonderful discussion. And um, just to remind you that the, dis the whole session will be recorded and um, has been recorded and will be available on the website of the IACB, as will be a summary of the, the discussion. And that leads me to thank John Heng, who works, just does such fantastic work for our association behind the scenes. Um, and then to um, remind you that our next webinar, the fifth of the seven, on this general theme of ethics and the pandemic, will be on June the 26th. And the question we'll be thinking about there is whether the Catholic ethical tradition has a distinctive public health ethics. And if indeed it does, what, what does that distinctive public health ethics uh, offer to everyone thinking about questions in public health ethics? So if um, we began with a prayer, may I finish now with a much shorter prayer, but it's a favourite one of mine, and I think it's um, appropriate for 
um, our occasion. It comes from Ecclesiasticus 51. I will thank you and praise you and bless the name of the Lord. When I was still a youth, before I went traveling, in my prayers, I asked outright for wisdom. My soul has fought to possess her. I have been scrupulous in keeping the law. I have stretched out my hands to heaven and bewailed the ignorance of her, my ignorance of her. I have directed my soul towards her and in purity have found her. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. I say thank you very much to everyone, in particular our speakers, and I look forward to seeing everyone next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.